That recording will be available uh, probably on the Proof Technic YouTube channel. We'll send out some details about where you can access that um, to all the registrants after the webinar. So happy Friday. Thank you for coming. Uh, this webinar is called Field Balancing, Brief Theory and Practice. It's presented by John Waldron and Christian Silbernagel, uh, two of my colleagues here at Proof Technic. Um, John Waldron is a graduate of Temple University with a mechanical engineering degree. He's been with Proof Technic for eight years. He started in field services and uh, has since moved on to a uh, direct sales position where he covers some territories here on the East Coast. Uh, he's a category three vibration analyst. He's working on his category four right now. Uh, and Christian Silbernagel, uh, also been with Proof Technic for, uh, I guess, a little more than seven years and also got to start in, in uh, machinery services out in the field before moving into a sales role. And now he's uh, managing the West Coast region for Proof Technic in the United States, as well as the Mexican market. Um, so these two guys will be presenting balancing for you. Uh, if you have, I'll be, I'll be keeping all of the participants besides the presenter on mute, um, just to avoid a lot of extra noise in the presentation. So uh, if you have to, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function. There's an icon on the bottom of the screen that says chat, and that'll bring up another window for you. Uh, and you can ask your questions in the chat and we'll moderate them and, and get to the questions at the end. Um, so once again, really thank everyone for coming here. We, we put these together to uh, kind of at the last minute to, um, to give us a, a, an opportunity to get together with, with some customers and, and with each other and partners um, while we're all kind of on lockdown or depending on where you live, I guess, uh, in any case, experiencing pretty slow business tempo due to the coronavirus. So we're overwhelmed with the response. I see people are filing in still. We, uh, we filled these, all our sessions up um, in just a matter of days. So we'll be looking to do this again. Um, but I guess that's probably enough out of me. I'm going to pass the mic over to John Waldron and we can get started. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, just to follow up on what Tim said, thanks guys for coming. Um, I'm coming to you today from my dining room table. Uh, so we're gonna try and keep this informative, but a little bit informal here. Um, I, Chris and I together put this presentation um, over the past couple of days. The idea here is that we're going to talk a little bit about theory. We're going to talk about some roadblocks you run into while you're on the field, uh, but also do a live walkthrough of settings in the Vibe Expert 2 uh, and, and do a small balance job here. I've got a, a makeshift grinder I put together uh, so we can sort of walk through these different steps of a balance job. <clears throat> and before we get started, um, it's, you know, Important to note here that without talking to each one of you individually before this starts, it's it's hard to pick a starting point. So we're going to start from the beginning. Uh, keep it really simple because we could spend all day talking about balancing and the different uh, little uh, nuances of it, but hope, hopefully give you some basics to feel comfortable doing it on your own. Uh, and so starting off here. You know, uh, again, starting from the basics, when I first learned about what unbalance was, was when I was a child riding in a car. You know, uh, if you've got a wheel or a tire that's left unbalanced, uh, can lead to uneven wear and at the very least an uncomfortable driving experience. So if we apply that to industry, uh, you know, this uneven wear could become bearing damage or seal damage or, you know, something catastrophic if it's bad enough. And so it's something that we need to address so we don't have this uncomfortable experience. Uh, but addressing balancing is not something that you need uh, an expert for. It's actually a simple ratio problem when we boil it down. So be confident in being able to do it on your own uh, with a little bit of guidance from someone who's done it before. So uh, like I said, over the next hour, we're going to informally uh, and briefly discuss some theory, some best practices, some roadblocks, and hopefully enough time to do a live walkthrough. Let's jump in. 
In order to talk about balancing and different types of unbalance, we need to define what unbalance is. So unbalance is the condition when the geometric center line of a rotational axis does not coincide with the mass center line. AKA there's a heavy spot on my fan or on my rotor that's causing it to want to turn outside of its natural center line. So we can define that mathematically and, and calculate a force for it with the mass, the distance from the geometrical center line and the rotational velocity. Um, I have this formula here. I don't want it to scare you. We will talk a little bit about math, but we're not going to dive into it because we've got smart balancers out there in the field with us that handle it for us. So the idea is to just give you an understanding of what the box is doing for you out in the field. So when we talk about unbalance, uh, what does that look like from a vibration standpoint? If we were to take a velocity spectrum, you're going to see a peak in the 1x, and 1x is a first order, which is essentially our running speed. Uh, and so that's going to show up in the velocity spectrum, typically in the radial directions, so horizontal or vertical, typically both. So what kind of unbalance can we see? Uh, there are three types. The first one we'll talk about is static unbalance. Uh, you, you can see it in one or two planes, uh, but we'll talk about it from a one plane perspective. And that is basically you have a heavy spot, or let's say you've got a bunch of dirt built up on one fan blade. That heavy spot, once you stop the machine, is likely going to roll to the, to the bottom of the machine because of gravity. And so one way to tell if you've got a static unbalance is to just wait, wait for it to settle, pick that fan up, turn it 90 degrees, and let go, and you'll see it settle back down. That's a clear indication that you have a static unbalance. But if you want to be a little bit more official about it, you can, again, measure that velocity spectrum, determine if you've got a 1x peak in a radial direction, and then measure the phase. Phase is going to be a key indicator here for determining the different types of unbalance. So static unbalance is going to have, uh, you see these phase diagrams at the bottom here. If you measure the bearings on either side of the rotor, you're going to see an in-phase relationship. Second one, oh, sorry, forgot to have this video here, sort of demonstrate what it would look like out in the field. This red brick is our heavy spot on the rotor. So we'd have a once per revolution uh, force. Next thing we're looking at here is going to be a moment or a couple unbalance. So this one's pretty different than the static unbalance because statically it looks balanced. And what's more important here is that it, this is a two plane problem. So you can see the rotor here is much wider, and we've got two different heavy spots. They're 180 degrees apart. We know that because if you draw a line from one to the other, it goes through the center line, which is why statically it looks balanced. They counteract each other. Vibration signal is still going to look the same. Velocity spectrum is going to have a 1x radial uh, dominant amplitude. Uh, the, the biggest difference here is that we're going to have a phase relationship of 180 degrees out of phase. This one is a little less common than, let's say, the static, but one plane or the next one we're going to look at, which is uh, called dynamic. With the video for something like that, you can see the brick growing is basically just saying it doesn't matter what size it is as long as they're 180 degrees apart, and they have an equal force. That's the only way that you get moment or a couple unbalance. So when we talk about dynamic unbalance, it's the same scenario, two planes with a heavy spot on either side of the rotor. But instead of being 180 degrees out, they are some other phase apart. And so what that does is it moves that center line away from the geometric center line. Um, 
and causes a different relationship. Still going to be a 1x velocity uh, ampl- uh, with high amplitude in the radial direction, but the phase relationship is going to be different. So statically, we are uh, in phase. For the couple, we are 180 degrees out of phase. And for this dynamic unbalance, we are neither of those. We are something else, some undefined phase relationship. So not in phase, not 180 degrees out of phase, but something else. So that's what something like this would look like. You can see two different weights or two different forces being generated, and they are definitely not 180 degrees apart. So when we talk about doing a balanced job, um, it's important to talk about where to put your vibration sensor. So the best practice is to put your vibration sensor where you catch the highest amplitude. When you walk up to a machine and balance is the thing that you need to do, my first step is gonna to be to measure all points and figure out where my highest amplitude is. Typically, uh, almost all of the time, you'll see that the bearings closest to the rotor are going to have the highest amplitude. So it's not going to be your motor that you're looking at. Um, and that's what these arrows are trying to designate for you. Green is saying that we have a much lower vibration amplitude than we do on our pedestal bearings here. And so what I would do is I'd walk up and I'd measure the first one in vertical, horizontal, and axial. I'd measure my second one vertical, horizontal, and axial figure out which direction gives me the highest values and start balancing from there. For two plane, you can see we have a much wider rotor, uh, which is important designation between single and dual plane. And again, we're looking at those pedestal bearings, but we're gonna have a sensor on each bearing. So, how do we know when we should do a single or a two-plane balance? There's a rule for that. When you want to do a two-plane balance or when you think you might, is when balance plane separation is equal to or greater than the rotor radius. So you can see here the width of where you're going to put your weight. So these red dotted lines are where I'm going to put my weight. If I measure that distance and it is greater than the radius, then I should be doing a two-plane balance. If you're unsure of what to do, I always say, err on the side of caution, do a two-plane balance, and a device like the Vibe Expert will actually tell you that a one-plane is recommended versus doing a one-plane, not knowing what that second plane is doing and potentially causing a problem. We also have a solution for that in the Vibe Expert, which I'll talk about during the live part. Another rule to talk about for when the two-plane balance. Um, so this one was an intermediate rotor, right? Got a bearing on either side of it. If we have an overhung rotor, we need to take into consideration uh, the distance between the rotor and the closest bearing. So if the distance from the closest bearing is less than half the plane separation, we need to do a two-plane balance. Hope that's clear. All right. So when we're doing balancing uh, for an overhung machine, typically your highest vibration in a single plane is going to be the closest bearing, uh, but it's always worthwhile to check. And then same thing for a dual plane, you're going to have two sensors, right? So you're going to put it on uh, the two bearings. But a corresponds to the closest bearing and B, the furthest separation plane is the furthest bearing. Sort of think of it like a pendulum. So this B is interacting with this bearing all the way over here. Uh, to be honest, when I first started learning about balancing, I thought that A and B would be switched. So with a few rules out of the way, uh, when we talk about balancing, we have to talk about vectors. Vectors are what enable us to do 
uh, balance equations. It's how we get from an unknown balance into a fully balanced ruler. So let's define what vectors are. Vectors consist of two things, a value, which we call an amplitude or a magnitude, uh, amplitude and vibration, magnitude and mass, and an angular direction, which in vibration we call phase. We can talk about it in vibration terms, right? We can talk about displacement, velocity, or acceleration. So displacement is measured in mils or microns, uh, which describes a distance. Velocity measured in inches per second or millimeters per second, giving us a rate of change of distance, also known as speed. And then we have acceleration measured in Gs, which gives us the rate of change of speed, also known as force. So uh, vectors separately can be represented by mass. Uh, so like when we add a trial weight or when we add a correction weight, we can talk about it the same way. A certain amount of weight, certain degree or phase. So ounces or for bigger machines, pounds, grams or kilograms. But um, the mathematical part of this that we're going to focus on is vector addition and and subtraction. And so we can take two vectors, we can add them together, and we can get a single resultant vector. And you can see here it's basically from tip to tail or front to back is how you would add them um, without going too far into detail. That's the idea. <clears throat> so uh, if we say, for example, we've got a fan with a missing fan blade but we've got another fan blade uh, four over from it that has a lot of dirt build up on it. We can actually figure out how those forces cancel each other out, the heavy spot versus the light spot of that missing fan blade uh, and draw a single resultant vector to figure out where that heavy spot is. All right, so like I said before, and this is just a ratio problem. It's not something to be scared about. Um, the only thing that really makes this a little bit difficult is taking into consideration the degrees that we're working with. Um, so in the beginning here, I'm going to eliminate that and just, just show you how this is a ratio problem. It will be oversimplified, but I think it's a good place to start. So if we say we, we have a known heavy spot, we can figure out where that heavy spot is. Uh, and measure it. So we've got four mils at this 90 degrees here. Uh, our natural inclination is to put a uh, weight 180 degrees apart from that so that we can bring that heavy spot back towards the center here. So what do we need to know in order to calculate that weight is this simple equation here. So we can measure our total amplitude of unbalance, which in this case is four mils. So we're in displacement. We can add a trial weight, right? We can tell the system what weight we're putting in, and we're going to put it at this 270 degrees. We can measure the change of vibration that we inflicted with that trial weight. And then from these three known variables, we can calculate our unknown correction weight. So with my four mils, I say I want to add two grams to it. And I measure that it gives us a one mil change. So instead of four mils here, we've actually reduced it down to three mils. So now we can figure out, okay, cross multiply my, my two times four equals eight. So eight is equal to one times my correction weight. Therefore, my correction weight is eight. And that is a simplified version of what we're doing out in the field when we're balancing. So I uh, hope that's clear. Let's take it a step further. So my red arrow here is going to be my original unbalance. I'm going to add a trial weight, for example, 10 grams at zero degrees. 
it's going to produce this yellow arrow here, which is the result of adding my trial weight. But in order to get my correction weight, I need to calculate what this green vector is, right? That green vector is going to be uh, our, our trial weight vector. This yellow one is the result of our original unbalance plus the trial weight. So from this triangle, we can do a series of sines and cosines uh, to figure out exactly what my correction weight and my angle is going to be. So dive in a little bit deeper, we'll add some numbers to this. If we say five mils at 135 degrees is our original run or our original unbalance. We add our trial weight, 10 grams, zero degrees. We get our resultant O plus T vector, which is three mils at 45 degrees. We then need to calculate our T vector which comes out to 5.83 mils at 45 degrees. So with all this information, which takes a little bit of uh, sines and cosines, like I said, the formulas become pretty sim simple. Calculating our correction weight, it's gonna be our trial weight times our original unbalance divided by our trial unbalance. So we can figure out that 8.57 grams is gonna get us there we just need to know what the angle is. In order to find our angle, we need to measure this angle, which gets us 360 minus 31 degrees, which is 329. Again, I don't wanna try and scare you with this math or confuse you in any way, just trying to show you exactly what we're doing. Uh, when we're doing this. And this, this circular plot here is really what you see when you're on the Vibe Expert, uh, and you're gonna see these vectors moving around. So you can sort of tell what's going on. <clears throat> now, in order to make sure that our angles are correct, we need to have our setup correct. When we set up for a balance job, there's not much that we need except for a speed sensor and a vibration sensor. Uh, talking about the Vibe Expert specifically, it uses a laser tack. And so that laser tack needs a piece of reflective tape on the shaft in order to measure the speed. So what is going to define our zero point for us is going to be that tape on the shaft and where that laser hits it. So um, if the laser is defining zero for us, we then also need to define the relationship between the sensor, the vibration sensor, and the speed sensor. Uh, in order to simplify this out in the field, what I like to do is put them both in the same plane, but of course that's not always possible. Uh, so it's important to know that the rotation of the machine is going to influence what, what that degree relationship is. So what I'm trying to say is that if it's rotating clockwise and they're 90 degrees apart, they might be 90 degrees apart, but if it's rotating counterclockwise, that could turn into 270. And I'll demonstrate this when we go to the live section as well. So when we're doing a balance job, uh, the sequence of events is that we put our laser uh, speed trigger on, we put our vibration sensor on, and then we take an original run. Right, so we wanna measure what the original unbalance is at the start of things. And then we're gonna put a trial weight on. And with that trial weight, we hope to move the original unbalance or the initial unbalance by 30% in amplitude or a 30 degree angle change. This is done so that we can get a very good, accurate calculation for what a correction weight needs to be. Uh, a word of caution here is that that 30% amplitude change should be for the better. And Chris is gonna explain why later, but um, the idea is that we're trying to make, make the rotor go closer to zero. And if you make it go further away from zero with your trial, you're into some uh, bigger headaches later. 
So again, it's 30% amplitude change or a 30 degree angle change. Preferably both, but it doesn't have to be that way. All right, a lot of words here, but the idea with this slide is to talk about one plane versus two plane balance. Uh, out in the field doing a one plane balance, even before smart balancers like the Vibe Expert uh, was doable. But doing a two plane balance was pretty difficult. So instead of trying to do a two plane balance at one time, what people would do is a one plane balance on one side, another one plane balance on the other side, move back to the first one, do a one plane balance. It's time consuming and can cause problems. Um, but the reason why you'd have to do a seesaw back and forth is because of something called cross effect. Right? So if I add weight to plane A, it's going to have an effect on plane B. And that's the nice thing about having a tool out in the field that can help you with it. So just to visualize that, what I'm saying is we have our initial unbalance measured, right? We've got a vibration sensor on plane A, vibration sensor on plane B. We add a trial weight to plane A, and we can actually measure the response that plane B has as a result of that, and vice versa, right? We add a trial weight to plane B, and we can measure the response that plane A has because of that. And so we've taken this complex math problem and simplified it quite a lot. Uh, doing a two-plane balance is actually a lot easier now than it ever was. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Chris, and uh, he's gonna talk for a while about balance standards, uh, resonance, some other things in the field to take into consideration. And once he's done, then I'm gonna walk through the Vibe Expert and uh, talk about all the different settings and hopefully show you a live demo. All right, uh, thank you very much, John. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. All right, very good. Yeah, um, let's talk first about the balance standards. So, um, let me just see, I have control, good. So, um, how much unbalance is actually too much unbalance? So we have different types of machines with varying rotor size and also running under different conditions, right? So in the below example, we have two rotors with the same weight, but running at different RPM. So we have, and now we apply the same momentum of 15 ounce inch and get different reactions from the system. So now we can see that the unbalanced forces are not linear with, with the speed. So they are actually proportional to the square of the running speed. Hence an unbalanced rotor at one speed will have four times the unbalanced force when the speed is doubled. This is what we should always take in consideration. That's why also John mentioned earlier when we apply the 30-30 rule, if we, if we are applying a trial weight, we want to bring actually our, um, our weight down by 30%, our amplitude, not the weight. So then the balancing standards. So the most common ones that are out there, like under the ISO uh, 1940, then API, military, and ANSI. All those standards are actually used in a smart balancing tool. So they are actually the basis to evaluate the balancing condition of rotating equipment. So let's have a look at the ISO balance spread and what does it consist of? So first of all, the type of the rotor, the weight of the rotor, um, the operating speed, and the amount of residual imbalance. So here we have like um, that chart out of the ISO that shows us the acceptable residual unbalance on the y-axis. And then you can see on the x-axis, we have the practical speed that is applied. And then through this chart, we see our different, our different grades. And now let's have a look at those grades. So here we see two of the most commonly used balance quality grades. Um, why that? Let's say the G2.5 and the G6.3 are actually covering a lot of machinery in the industry. So there's different crates existing next to those, but those ones would cover around 80% of our machinery in the field. For example, 
G2.5, like for um, turbine-driven pumps, machine tool drives, or the 6.3 with gears, machinery in general, pumps, process plant machines. So all the um, calculations, as also John mentioned earlier, and also the evaluation, all this is put into a smart balancing device. And this will be used to evaluate and to re-evaluate after each balancing run. Okay, now let's talk about resonance. Resonance, actually, this phenomena is one of the most common obstacles, uh, or you can even say it, a headache, that we are um, going to see when we are doing field balancing. So, actually, resonance means the machine is operated at a critical speed that brings the system into resonance and therefore into high excessive vibration. So, Let's have a look at this chart here, or those two charts. So we're having here on both x-axis our revolutions per minute, so the RPM, and then we have here our amplitude, and here we have the phase. Our resonance zone is actually marked in red here. So what does happen if we're um, actually hitting a critical speed and are going into resonance? Our phase starts to roll 180 degrees the amplitude increases while we are going into resonance and gets its max when we are at 90 degrees in phase. So trial rates and correction rates that affect the amplitude will cause the phase to roll. And typical symptoms of resonance, as you see in the below screen, the phase shifts with the speed changes, the amplitude changes with the speed changes, Phase and amplitude are very difficult to stabilize because here we see this very steep slope. So when we are in resonance and, uh, and the speed varies just a little, we get a different phase response. And resonance can be found in the shaft or in the structure itself. So let's have a look how the shaft behaves below resonance. So below resonance, the rotor on the shaft uh, wants to rotate actually around its machine center. So the high spot equals the heavy spot. Above the resonance, the rotor wants to rotate around the center of the mass now. And the high spot equals now the light spot. So the center line deflects. The rotor high spot goes past the sensor and the mass is on the opposite side. And this is also why our phase angle changes. So things to do when, uh, when we're talking about resonance. So try to balance at least 10% or more away from resonance. So in resonance, the additional try rates and correction rates will change the amplitude. And this will also cause your face to roll. In some cases, we are not able to, example, to change the RPM to go out of the resonance. And sometimes you are faced with that you have to balance in resonance. And there, you can use a rule of thumb. So when we are doing balancing within resonance, try to do a one balance shot. And this will typically reduce the vibration, leave the correction, wait on, but do not trim. So restart your balancing program and do additional runs with the new trial rates. And this will usually take a couple of runs more than you are used to, um, but it, um, it, it will actually bring down um, your values to an acceptable residual imbalance. And then before we actually start our balancing, we always want to make sure that we are actually not facing another problem that is just um, indicate us this is balancing, but it, it actually isn't. So when we take our, our vibration readings, and then we have a look on the horizontal measurements, and if that one is two times more than the vertical measurement in amplitude, or the vertical is two times more than the horizontal measurement, then probably we are having a resonance. Horizontal plane vector does not shift 90 degrees from the vertical plane vector. So something else might be contributing to the amplitude. So further measurements, vibration measurements should be applied. 
And we can balance machine all day long, but if that is not the problem, we need to watch out what are those problems. So when we're having a look at, before we actually start our balancing job, it is always useful to do a run up or a coast down to identify the critical speeds. You can also do a cascade plot to identify, okay, where are my potential resonances so that I can keep out of those. Misalignment also causes in your vibration readings a very significant 1x. Or for example, um, if, we're having, if we are faced with looseness or rotating looseness, specifically on rotating looseness, there we can verify do we have rotating looseness if we are looking on our face measurements. Because you will see actually that you have a somewhat erratic face on um, this um, on this type of problem. So your face will be all over your polar plot. Or for example, a bent shaft. A bent shaft also shows you a very significant 1x. But if we are taking our measurements, um, our face measurements across the shaft and having a look on the actual measurements, then we see that we would find, for example, for this failure mode, a 180 degrees face shift. And also watch out, for example, on belt driven machines for eccentric belt sheaves, electric motor problems, cavitation, or as we have also seen um, previously showed by John, loose couplings. So now let's talk about nonlinear response. So whenever we are doing balancing in the field, we are somewhat depending on the entire structure of the machinery is vibrating in a linear way. So as we learn the theory, we are doing our vector additions, we are depending on that the machinery is vibrating in a linear way. So that would mean, for example, if you have eight mils of vibration and you happen to know right away where the heavy spot is, and then you apply two grams on the direct opposite, and the vibration would go down four mils now, and then you add another two grams on the exact same correction spot, then this should bring your vibration down to zero, right? But in many cases, we are actually faced with a nonlinear system. So let's have a look at the application below. So here we are looking on the cooling tower. So if you would apply to the structure a very small force, then the structure will behave relatively stiff. If we are now applying a large force to the same structure, for example, with a very high imbalance, then now the structure um, becomes relatively flexible and we are getting a non-linear response from the system itself. But a smart balancing tool um, will actually take the last correction dry weights to recalibrate itself after each, after each job, um, so after each shot, balancing shot, and you will be able to do your balancing. Another obstacle is um, external machine interferences. So there is a phenomenon called beating. Let's say, like in this example, we have two machines um, sitting on the same structure and they are running at the same RPM. Due to their slip frequency being different, they are actually not completely, um, not completely running at the same RPM, and so it can create the phenomena of beating. So we can have in-phase beating um, if both machines are actually freely moving to, to the left or out of phase if they are moving um, with um, actually out of phase. And there is actually a possibility to go around this problem to have those interferences. So if you have an unstable phase and amplitude and you have those beat frequencies because your original vector on the polar diagram, you will see when you have the effect of beating that your original vector starts to move around um, its, own, um, its own center. So it's actually moving all around and is very unstable. And what you can use on a smart balancing tool is um, something that time that is called time synchronous filtering. And what we're actually doing here is that we are using our RPM trigger that we are getting um, from 
machine A and the sensor that is applied to, to um, machine A, we are synchronizing those signals and then you can actually filter out all other interferences. Then another very common obstacle, sounds very simple, but it's very common, it's like dirt and debris. Then because like every kind of mass in, in terms like now here dirt, if you apply that onto your fan, it will bring your fan out of balance. Also, changing load, and as we learned earlier, changing RPM, um, so during varying operating states, we are faced that our amplitude and phase are actually changing. As well, rotor heating and cooling. In many kind of industries, for example, like the mining industry, when we are using also um, processing gases that are going through the fan, we are faced like that when we are doing balancing, we probably do that um, when the entire rotor is in the cold condition. So you might get um, an acceptable residual unbalanced value at the end of the day, but then afterwards, when you're starting your machine up and it goes in operating condition and it's heating up, your rotor will change and it can actually go back into an imbalanced state. And now John will take over and demonstrate to you um, a walkthrough of a balancing job. All right, thanks, Chris. Um, can you let me know that you guys can hear me again? Yep. Yeah, we can hear you. Very good. Great. Uh, so now I'm going to share my Vibe Expert, um, which you should be able to see at this point. And I'm also going to turn my video on. So hopefully you guys can see me. Uh, we hang tight for one second. All right. I'll also just really recommend for everybody if you find John's video. Uh, and click on those three little dots. You can select to pin the video, uh, and then you can switch back and forth very easily with this uh, button that says swap. All right. Give everyone a second to try and get that sorted here and try and get this video set up a little bit better. So you should be able to see my rotor here. Uh, unfortunately, you have to look at my face a little bit. And my vibe expert, and I've got some balancing clay and a small scale here. So if you're looking at my screen of the vibe expert, it is uh, mirroring. And I'm hoping that if you, you've got a Vibe Expert, you're at least a little bit familiar with how to use it. But if you're not, uh, that's okay. We're going to walk through it step by step here so we can see what we're looking at. And I am going to focus just on balancing here. So if you've got other questions, uh, maybe we could address it afterwards. So if I go into the balancing program, you can see we've got three different tabs diagnosis, one plane balance, two plane balance. And so what we're trying to do here. Uh, with diagnosis is confirmed, like Chris said, that we don't have any other issues going on, that we in fact have an unbalanced problem and that's what we're here to correct. So we've got an overall vibration uh, app here. We've got a velocity spectrum here, a velocity time waveform here. We can check our speed. We can measure phase uh, with one sensor or we can do a dual phase measurement. And so all of these things uh, should be enough to get us an answer on whether or not unbalance is our problem. After you've confirmed that, we have to then pick what kind of scenario we have. Do we have a one-plane balance problem and a two-plane balance problem? 
So if you look at this rotor, you can see it's pretty narrow here uh, and it's pretty short. So we're going to say that this is a one plane overhung. But just to take a look at the two planes, there's a few more options here. You can say, you know, two planes overhung, two planes intermediate, or are they split in some way? So going back to our application here, we've got one plane overhung because here is my bearing and here's my other bearing. I've got my vibration sensors set up here and I've got my speed sensors set up here. And so I was talking before about setting that trigger angle. Uh, we're going to talk about that too during this setup here. So on my one plane overhung, if I hit menu, task manager, brings up a few options. So the task itself, we could pick the pre-made option that comes with the device called one plane overhung. But you can see there's a nice lock next to that. And so that's going to tell us that we can't make any changes to it. So I made a user one so that we can have the opportunity to make some changes. Since it is one plane, we have to tell it which channel we're going to use. It's a two channel device, channel A, channel B. I've got it plugged into channel A up here. Then we have to tell it what our measurement setup is going to look like. So if I hit menu, scroll down to edit, I can do that. This task is used in other places. I'm going to say let's edit it anyway. So when we talk about our measurement setup, this is where we're picking our units, right? Do we want displacement? Do we want velocity? Do we want acceleration? So each one of those has a pre-built-in task with a lock next to it, and each one has its own user uh, task underneath of it. So I'm going to keep user balancing in the velocity measurement quantity. Uh, my options, what does it look like? We've got lower frequency, so 30, 60, 120, or 600 CPM. And I know that this grinder runs at a few thousand, 2,000, maybe 3,000 RPM, so 600 is going to be sufficient. We'll say yes, we're going to keep a low pass filter on. And five measurements will definitely be enough here. Um, it lets you affect the number of measurements. You can go much higher, you can go lower. Uh, the only time I would do measurements significantly higher would be on a very slow speed machine for something like uh, the wind industry. There you want to increase the number of measurements that you take so that you get good quality readings. Time synchronous averaging. Chris briefly described what that is for us, and it's going to help us avoid things like beating out in the field. Uh, so I'm going to leave that set to auto instead of having manual or infinite. Auto is going to apply when it needs to apply. Measurement range is going to be something like our dynamic range, right? So what amplitude of vibration are we measuring? And before taking any readings on this, it's difficult to say uh, what is appropriate here. So instead, I keep it as auto and let the box take a sample reading and properly set its own measurement range, which is nice. So once I'm done there, hit menu, OK. Make sure I have the right sensor. So take this guy off here, slide back the cover. And right here, it says type VID 6.142. Put that back in place. So we've got the right sensor, um, but there are a lot more sensors in here. My short list is only two sensors, but there's 38 more sensors programmed in. The sensor list could be as long as you want it to be. Uh, VibeXpert 2 will work with pretty much any sensor, ICP, CLD, uh, whatever, whatever it is you have to work with, which is convenient. Next, we have the measurement, uh, excuse me, the machine setup. So again, you could do something that's pre-made in here, or you could do something uh, of a user variety. So I made a custom for this specific grinder. So let's take a look at it. There's a lot of options in here. I don't want this to overwhelm you. Um, most of it is straightforward, and I'll explain the stuff that's not. So correction mode is basically how are we going to add weight to this rotor. We have free, fixed location, fixed weight, or measurement tape. 
Free is going to give us degrees, right? So 360 degrees around. Fixed location would be, for example, the number of fan blades that you're going to use. So if you've got eight fan blades, then you would use fixed location and you would type in eight. Fixed weight is going to be, let's say you're a service company, you go out to do a job and you realize that you left your balance weights at home. Uh, you could actually take washers or something like that if you had a handful of washers that were all the same size and use those to try and get the job done. It's going to be a little bit messy and you're going to have to put weights opposite each other uh, to try and get it done, but it is possible. The last one, which I haven't had a chance to use out in the field, but I think is pretty interesting, is measurement tape. Um, this could help you be a little bit more accurate instead of using degrees when you're trying to figure out, uh, you know, you have your 90 degrees, your 45 degrees, somewhere in between. That might be a little bit difficult. Measurement tape could sort that out for you. And so what you're doing here is basically measuring around the outer edge of the rotor or the circumference, and you're going to get it in inches instead of degrees. Kind of a cool idea. In this case, I'm going to use free because uh, I don't even have a measurement tape here to, to use. So uh, next, trial and trim weights. Are you going to add or remove? In our case, we're going to add, but if you had a bunch of weights on there, you could potentially do a remove. Uh, some people will grind uh, parts of a blade off to try and do it that way. Balance quality, Chris talked a lot about. It's already built in here, that G scale, and you can see all the different options. For most industrial applications, we're looking in this 6.3 or 2.5 range. I'm going to pick the tighter of the two, the 2.5, and we'll see if we can hit that. Use different radii. Uh, this one doesn't apply to us in this specific setup, but the idea here is that you can put a trial weight at one radius, and then you could put a correction weight at a smaller or larger radius. So further or closer to uh, the center line of the machine. Where this applies, again, is like the wind industry. Uh, they'll put a trial weight very close to the hub so it's easy to access. And then once they know that they have the proper correction weight and the proper correction angle, they'll actually run it all the way out to the tip of the blade so they have much less weight uh, to apply the same amount of force. So we're not going to use it here, um, but we do still need to put in the radius and the rotor mass in order to calculate a trial weight with the Vibe Expert. <clears throat> uh, I did a rough measurement and got it right around two and a half inches, so we're going to leave it as such. And the rotor mass, I made a guesstimate of 10 pounds. Uh, these two are important for calculating the auto trial weight, like I said. Um, if you grossly misjudge this, it could be potentially dangerous, right? If you say it's a 10,000 pound rotor and it's uh, really only a thousand pounds, the correction weight or the trial weight that it gives you, not the correction weight, the trial weight, could be uh, significantly heavier than it should be causing, you know, a catastrophic failure. So, it's important to get in the right ballpark if you're going to ask for an auto trial weight. Um, with that in mind, the Vibe Expert is conservative when it gives a trial weight because it doesn't want to cause damage, doesn't want to cause problems. Um, so it's going to give you maybe a little bit lighter of a trial weight uh, to be on the safe side. So with these two things, radius, rotor mass, saying yes, we want it to give us a trial weight because we're not sure what to do for this situation. Uh, we need to tell it what the trigger angle is gonna be. And that trigger angle is what I keep coming back to, this relationship between the photo tack and the vibration sensor. So in this specific instance, I've got my laser tack angled up here so that it's shooting in the horizontal plane and it'll be zero. But what if, for example, I took my vibration sensor and I moved it in the vertical direction? Now, what is my trigger angle? It's impossible for you to tell there unless you can see what's hidden back here is the, the rotation of this machine. So uh, the rotation is actually in this direction. And in order to calculate the angle between my laser 
and my sensor, I need to know that rotation angle. So it rotates this way, which means I'm going to count this way. So if I count back that way, this is a 90 degree difference between the two. If it rotated the other way, we'd be looking at a 270 degree difference. This is very important in order to get the right values out of the vibe expert because it's only as smart as the information that you put into it. If you put bad info in, you're going to get bad info out. And that's something that I try to tell everyone when I'm doing uh, balanced training is that the, the device is only as smart as the person that's using it. So if you're not educated on how to use it and how to do balancing, then you're going to have a hard time. <clears throat> so I'll put my sensor back here. Have my trigger, trigger angle set to zero. And the next thing we should talk about is speed or balance quality. So you see up here, I set my balance quality to 2.5. But let's say I started this machine up or, or before I shut it down to do a balance job, uh, it was shaking like crazy and I'm, I'm scared to run it at the same speed. Um, so what I could actually do is run it at a lower speed and I could input it in here, the speed that I want to balance for. So I could run it at 900 RPM, but I could balance for 3,600 uh, speed quality. So I can reduce the risk of causing some sort of problem, balance it down at 900 RPM so that it will be happy when it's running at 3,600. Next thing I have here is check speed. Uh, so what that's going to do is make sure that my speed remains stable throughout my different measurements. If I put my uh, original run speed at 3,000 and then my trial weight speed at 1,800 and then my correction speed at 2,500, I'm going to have issues. My phase is going to start to change uh, and I'm going to see different amplitudes and it's going to be hard for the device or impossible for the device to calculate uh, what the proper correction weight and angle should be. Control second plane is a nice feature, which I alluded to earlier. It's this idea that if we're unsure, we should be doing a one plane or a two plane balance. I can say, okay, I'm going to do a one plane balance, but I'm going to add a second sensor and I'm going to watch that second plane. So I can turn this on and I can watch that second plane with this saying yes. And I can take that even a step further and I can say, I want to minimize the error in my second plane or minimize the bad influence I'm going to have by correcting my first plane to my second plane. And so that's going to give us sort of a best fit and balance between plane one and plane two while only touching plane one. Uh, I know I don't need to do that here, so I'm going to turn that off. Auto average is going to average my results, uh, so we want to keep that. Check for stability is going to basically look for the pointer to remain stable while we're taking these readings. If we see that the phase starts to roll or that amplitude starts to dramatically change, it's going to let us know. Check for bad influence. That's going to be beating and things like that that Chris was talking about, you know, outside um, influence on, on our balance job. Recalculating coefficient is related to that cross effect kind of thing that I was talking about before where, you know, uh, what is the rotor's response to us adding trial weights and correction weights and things like that. So we'll keep that as yes. And then free run, if I change this to yes, it's going to cancel everything out above it. You'll see it's all grayed out. The idea with this is that me telling you I want to do free run is that I don't want it to give me any input. I'm going to tell it what I want to do and it's just going to measure the response for me so that I can, let's say, make a report later. Uh, but I don't want to do that here. What we're going to do is get some influence from the Vive Expert. It's going to help us do a good job here. So that's all of these. I can now hit menu OK. I've got my RPM set. I uh, don't need to change that and we're good to go. All right. So. Uh, step one is going to be to measure the original unbalance. Then we're going to add a trial weight, measure that response, and from that get a correction weight. Um, so let's jump into it. 
I'm going to turn this rotor on. I'm not sure how noisy it's going to be. So if it's uh, too whiny or something, maybe Tim, you can let me know and I'll, I'll mute myself. But otherwise, I'm going to keep the volume on. Yeah, you got it. All right, so my rotor's on. Give it a second to stabilize. And then I'll hit start here, take an initial RPM reading, and then we should get a phase and an amplitude. All right, now I'm just waiting a second to see if anything moves, but it looks very, very stable, so that's great. So I'm going to hit enter to pause, and then I'm going to turn my rotor off. So you can see on our polar plot here, uh, we've got an amplitude of 0 0.17 inches per second and a phase of 213 degrees. Um, you might be able to see down at the bottom here on the Vibe Expert the speed, so it's 2938. So those are the parameters we're going to be looking at this whole time, right? Uh, move on to my next screen here. It's going to give me a trial weight of 1.1 grams at three degrees. Now, if I wanted to, I could change this to whatever I want if I think the machine's wrong, uh, but I'm going to just listen to what it tells me to do. So 1.1 grams at three degrees. Take some of my clay here. Pretty good, 1.1 grams. I'm gonna walk around here and <clears throat> find my zero point. And again, it's rotating this way, so I need to count that way. Uh, so I'm basically gonna put it right next to my piece of tape. All So because we have a piece of clay, right, as I push it up into that rotor, it's going to sort of spread out a little bit. So it's hard to get these degrees perfect, but uh, let's see what happens. So I've got my 1.1 grams, three degrees, and I'm ready to measure again. I'll turn this on. Feels pretty good. Let it start here. Adjusting measurement range means that it's changing that dynamic range. Uh, so we clearly made a change here. Everything appears pretty stable. We pause it, turn the rotor off. So we've got an amplitude of 0 0.047, phase of 172 degrees, and RPM 2937. So um, we changed the amplitude by more than 50% and we changed the phase uh, enough. Can't do math in my head right now. But uh, so we've got enough change. It would have yelled at us if we didn't. And so the next step is to say, okay, was that uh, a good enough change that you want to keep the trial weight or do you want to remove it because it's not helpful? In this case, it helped us quite a bit. Uh, so I'm going to say, no, I don't want to remove the trial weight. And I'm going to see what, what it asks us to do next. So in this case, it's saying it wants 0.7 Gs at 299 degrees. Pretty good. 299 degrees. Again, I find my zero point. There's 180. There's 270. So right about here.
Now that I got that, I'm ready to take some more readings. Looks pretty stable, so I'm going to pause that. Turn my rotor off. You can see we've got a smiley face already in the top right hand corner because our amplitude is super low. Uh, we've got 0 0.012 at a phase of 305 degrees. So you can see on the Vibe Expert there uh, what happened, right? My Where I put the clay was off. Um, sorry. Where I put the clay was off just a little bit on the phase angle. And it looks like I put just a little bit too much. Otherwise, we would have ended up right on that zero. Uh, but it, in the field, 0 0.012 inches per second in amplitude, I'll take that all day. Uh, and our speed, again, stayed the same, 29.36. I think we've changed two RPM over the course of this balance job. Uh, so I'm going to say no. I don't want to remove the trim weight. And you can see we could keep going all day long if we wanted to. Um, but at the bottom here, you're going to see the balance quality and the residual force that's left over. So that's how we get into uh, that balance grade. And all of this is available in a PDF report. You can take it straight off the device. And you got the nice little summary of what we did there. I know that this is a pretty simplified setup, right? I'm using uh, basically Play-Doh and I've got a small scale here and a small grinder, but guys, this is, this is what in the field balancing looks like. There's a few more precautions you have to take and you're wearing a hard hat and safety glasses, but uh, this is basically it. And so I hope that this was helpful. Um, if you've got any questions, shoot them at us, but um, that's, that summarizes what we're doing. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Christian. Um, terrific presentation. If anyone has any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll, we'll take care of them right now. We can stick around for a few minutes. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, um, a, client, a client asked me to the following question. You balance, how can you measure the angle of attack of the blaze of some cooling tower um, ventilators? Uh, the angle of attack of each of the blades so that they are all the same, is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a good question. That's slightly outside the balancing world, but it definitely plays a part in this. Uh, I know, especially for wind turbines, that that is something that needs to be taken into consideration before even starting a balance job. But I can honestly tell you, I don't have much experience with measuring the angle of attack. Okay. I understand. <laughs> I got a question. This is Dale from Turn Technologies. Now I've done several balances, one a pretty major one on a hydro, and I set it up for two plane run just because of the length it was probably where the add weight was about five feet. Diameter is also about probably five feet or well, across a two and a half feet radius. And when I did when I did the run, it shut me down to a single plane, um, single plane um, balance. Now, is there a way to keep that single plane balance or that dual plane balance and change it into a single plane balance so I don't have to do another major run? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, unfortunately, you do have to back out and go into a single plane. Um, 
uh, from my experience, it's been a while since I've had that happen, but um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you need to start over on well, a single plane. The thing with that is this was, you know, this was major. By the time we had to change stuff, we had lockout, tag out on valves. <clears throat> and as you can understand, quite a few things. Is there a way sure. or are they looking at in the future being able to maybe add numbers into this? Let's say I already have made a run or let's say it's critical or something like that and it's difficult. I could use prior data slash maybe something I got off of, um, you know, from a round or so from a past data collection. Is there a yeah. way that we're going to be able to enter other data into it? There is a way to actually save coefficient data already in the Vibe Expert 2. Um, and that might be a step in the right direction. But also, you know, uh, in your specific example, you're talking about going from a two plane to a one plane. And that's uh, just a suggestion that the Vibe Expert makes. You, If you're worried about the number of runs that you have to do, you, you can't ignore that. Um, and maybe you could just focus on the one plane and you can zero out the other plane, like, you know, saying that you're not going to add any correction weight there. Oh. It gives you suggestions here, like this 0 0.1 at 80 degrees. Uh, I can hit enter here and I can tell it exactly what I'm going to do. So oh. I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but um, I, I don't know about the future, um, but I can tell you that. Now, how do you cancel out of it? Because I, I mean, it's been a while, and for for life, me, I couldn't remember me that I could override it. Couldn't override what exactly? Well, I still, you know, let's say I wanted to stay in a two plane, mm -hmm. and it came up. I needed to do a single plane, and that's what it came up. And I do not remember if I was able I'm, to I'm, force to, yeah, to pretty, override it. I'm I'm confident. Uh, you can keep going with that two plane. Okay. I mean, it's something that's been a bit since I've done it. It's been several years, but I've run across it before, basically. So I usually just go directly do a single plane because that's nine times out of ten is going to be help me and put me where I need to go anyway. Sure. Understood. Yeah, I mean, those rules of thumb are, are just helpful. You know, they're not uh, they're not biblical. Okay, okay, thank you. You have an idea about, uh, you know, it sounds like you're saying you'd like to be able to kind of change your the settings you put in before uh, you took the measurement and still, you know, after you've taken the measurement, since the measurement itself is the same. I mean, that, that sounds like a good recommendation. If you if you could kind of articulate that example for me in an email or something, I'd appreciate that. And I'll, I'll send it over to the guys in development for the, to keep yeah. in mind. Because that's some stuff like I, you know, I'm looking at like when we're running turbines and we already have Fagas angles and we have some data, and all we'd have to do is just plug in, you know, I know what my one time is, you know, stuff like that, just to, you know, you know, less runs or see if it's, if it's even worth to attempt. Gotcha. Understood. Thanks. There's a question in the chat from Dean. Says, what about a slow speed unit such as a hydroelectric generator spinning at 120 RPM with sleeve bearings? Yeah, I mean, the slower you go, the the less force you're going to get, but you could still do um, you could still do a balance on it. Sleeve bearings are a little bit difficult. You probably don't want to be using an accelerometer at that point. Um, but yeah, you could still do a balance on that. Yeah, I guess our issue, and maybe we didn't have the right probe, is we didn't we didn't have hardly any energy, and it was hard to get a stable reading. And at the end of the yeah, day, yeah. we ended up adding two hundred pounds. It added two hundred pounds, and it helped. Very good. Yeah, I mean, you're you're probably looking at um, you know hopefully a prox probe or something like that, and, um, measuring in displacement. Yeah, and I guess we didn't have that, so. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. 
All right, if anybody has any more questions, now's the time. When will this be posted? Um, you guys did a pretty good job of explaining stuff. When will this be posted? Uh, we'll send out an email with the recording on uh, Monday to all the registrants. Awesome, thank you. For all our, uh, our partners that are on here, I'll, I'll post the, the link to it on Slack. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate the good turnout, the questions, the participation. We uh, hope you have a great weekend. Stay healthy and safe. And uh, please keep an eye out on our, our social media channels for uh, other webinar opportunities that we'll be putting together to try to get keep everyone together through this um, unusual time. All right. Nice job. Thanks. Great job, Chris and John. Gabriella, thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend.